mountains today. Yeah, looks pretty good. I hope these clouds don't open up on us. What is that? Somebody hurt? Stop. Go check it out. Go look. Las Cruces, New Mexico, a vibrant college town dominated by the sprawling campus of the State University. When school's going on and in session, the city swells. We get a lot more people here because of all the students. After dark, students and locals hit the town to party, never imagining that good times could bring imminent danger. There's something about the nighttime that brings out the good in, in some people and the worst in some people. And in the summer of 2003, the unthinkable occurs. <laughs> a couple miles from town, the body of a young woman is found in the desert, dressed in nothing but a t-shirt. These things don't happen, especially to, you know, these young, vivacious girls. Why is she out here? Who put her here? She didn't deserve to be found in the desert like this. Within an hour, homicide investigators arrive at the scene. They saw a female laying face down. Uh, her pants had been removed. They were wrapped around her waist. She's nude from the waist down. They estimate her age to be early 20s. She's Caucasian and beautiful, perhaps a student at nearby New Mexico State and she died a tragic and painful death. It appeared that she'd obviously been sexually assaulted. There was a little bit of bruising around her neck Lig area. Ligature marks across her Pretty neck. slight. We thought there might be a possibility that she was strangled. Her shoes are missing. She has scratches and abrasions on her hands and arms. It looks like she was killed the previous night and put up a real fight. It was obvious that those were done while she was alive, and that she was either trying to get away or she'd been drugged on the ground. And everything at the scene tells detectives the woman wasn't killed here. There were no signs of any kind of struggle in the scene that would make you believe that, that she was killed right there where she was laying. They have to get rid of the body somewhere. And a lot of times, they'll, they'll dump them out in the desert in an attempt to conceal the crime that they've committed. As detectives look closer, they make a horrific discovery. These burn marks are definitely post-mortem. The back of the victim's shirt is seared away, exposing a series of severe burns on her back and arm. She had some charring on her right arm and on her back where something had been poured on her. There's tire and footprints all over the area. But one fresh section of track draws investigators' attention. Go in this way. Back up, back up straight towards the body. There's one dirt road going in. You could see that a vehicle drove up to that location and then kind of backed in. So they drive in, backed in, and then drove back out. Detectives take castings of what they think are the killer's tire tracks using a special mix of plaster. There was a good possibility that those tires, if we could identify, you know, the wheelbase and everything like that, it might narrow down what type of vehicle it was. Since this looks like a sexual assault, investigators hope some of the attacker's DNA will show up on his victim's body. And if she's sexually assaulted, then, you know, we're hoping that we're gonna have some form of DNA in, in the sexual assault kit. It doesn't take long for investigators to learn of a missing persons report filed that morning with local police in Las Cruces. 22-year-old Katie Sepich from Carlsbad, New Mexico, disappeared last night. Katie 
was a very lively, happy, smart, beautiful young girl who was ready to take on the world. Loved ones described Katie as a vibrant and pretty girl who had a special nickname in her family. We call Katie Kamikaze Katie because she was absolutely fearless. She was very exuberant. She was vivacious. She walked into a room and owned it. She did everything 300%, <laughs> um, full force, would like run over you like a Mack truck um, with her enthusiasm. That's how she loved people, that's how she helped people. It was just bigger. Katie was a grad student in business administration at New Mexico State University. She was smart without having to really try. I mean, she made great grades without having to put in tons and tons of effort. I said, Katie, what, what do you want to do when you, when you get this degree? And she said, you know, I really don't know. She said, but I want to do something big. She said, you know, Mom, I really, I really want to change the world. She was in a happy and committed relationship. And she and her boyfriend, Joe, were beginning to talk about a future together. I think Katie really believed that Joe was the man that she was going to marry, that was going to be the father of her children. Katie and Joe met as undergrads. Recently, the young couple had even bought a ring together. We were shopping, and I noticed a ring on her finger. And I said, Katie, I don't think I've seen that ring before. Where'd you get that ring? And she said, Joe gave me the ring. After their senior year together, Katie pursued a master's degree while Joe went home to work in the family business. Katie's roommate, Tracy, tells detectives that on the night she disappeared, they had gone to a Labor Day house party in the High Range neighborhood, just blocks from where they lived. The students there are not known to be these wild, like, animal house kind of parties. They're more like, you know, having drinks, maybe a band. It's, you don't hear about a lot of crazy things going on at these parties. 20 to 30 college-age kids were there, including Katie's boyfriend, Joe. It's their big weekend. It's their first time to get together and hang out. Katie's roommate, Tracy, crashed that night at the party house along with a bunch of other kids. When she woke up in the morning, Katie wasn't there. And Joe, her boyfriend, Joe, get up. didn't seem to know what had happened to her. Katie. At that time, nothing was said. It was just, she's not here, she left. I think she probably went to someone's house. Joe tells police that Katie left the party around three in the morning leaving him with her purse, keys, and cell phone. It made me nervous. I was worried initially because she didn't have anything with her. Um, like, if she had had her purse, had her phone, any of that, I wouldn't have been as worried. When she didn't hear from Katie the next day, Tracy called all of their friends, and then the emergency room of the local hospital. Finally, she called Katie's mother, Jayanne, four hours away in Carlsbad. I had that feeling in the pit of my stomach that parents get when something's just not right with their child. And when Tracy called and when she said, have you talked to Katie today? I knew immediately that something was horribly wrong. Within a couple hours, police realized the Sepich's missing daughter must be the dead girl they found in the desert. Katie's father has the agonizing task of identifying his daughter's body at the morgue. And he told me later that when they pulled back the sheet and he had to look at her face that was bruised and contorted in pain, he said he fell to his knees and he just asked God to take him to me. No father should ever have to go. Katie's death leaves a heartbreaking wound in the Sepich family. Her mother struggles to cope with the ultimate tragedy for any parent. I can't imagine anything more startling 
or more painful than learning that your daughter has been raped and murdered. That first few days that they were working so hard to investigate Katie's murder, I was working to hold on to my sanity. For investigators, anyone at the house party could be responsible for Katie's brutal death. There were a lot of people there. There are a lot of possible witnesses, and police are wanting to talk to every single one of them. We had 30 people at the party that we had to try to round up, interview, lock into a story. Every single one of those people they're talking to is a suspect, especially the males. Somebody knows what really happened to Katie Seppich in the dead of night. Coming up next, the investigation zeroes in on a startling suspect. I cannot believe that. People had seen them arguing. He wasn't just flirting with another girl. He was actually caught kissing another girl at the party. And that's really what set Katie off. Grad student Katie Seppich was brutally murdered and dumped in a desert landfill in the middle of the night. Lush Cruz has its homicides, of course it does. But it's very unusual to find a young lady left in the manner that she was. This girl did not have to go through this. Why? Who would do something like this to someone so young? The quiet city of Las Cruces may still have a killer walking its streets. What is going on? Is somebody going after NMSU girls? Is this going to be, is there going to be another one? What is going on? We need to find this person right away and stop him. At New Mexico State University, students are frightened. They're told by school officials not to walk alone after dark. I know that a lot of Katie's friends were, were very fearful. If someone could kill Katie like that, could it happen to me? You know, I think a lot of her friends were worried about that. Police believe Katie was killed sometime before dawn, but they have no clue where it happened. Autopsy results verify that Katie died of strangulation after having been sexually assaulted. And the coroner confirms what police already suspected. They determined that the burn marks on her back were from someone trying to set her body on fire. The coroner believes Katie's killer poured a flammable liquid on her body and then lit it in an attempt to destroy evidence. I'm sure when he left, he probably thought, oh, that's a good flame about her. But he clearly had no experience trying to burn a body. The fire burned itself out, and the autopsy reveals that Katie's killer left behind critical evidence, DNA from his own body. That gives investigators a fighting chance to catch him. It was discovered that there was three different locations where DNA had been located on Katie's body, and it all matched the same individual. One of those places was Katie's hands. She fought so hard for her life, she got her attacker's blood and skin under her fingernails. That gave us hope. We knew we had the identity of the man that killed our daughter. We just need to match it to a name. Looking at it right now. We were confident that, you know, that struggle wasn't going to be in vain. OK, well. Just felt like at some point, you know, we, we'd get him. Looking for leads, detectives examine Katie's house. Inside, there's nothing out of place. But outside is a very different story. Her bedroom window is locked, but the screen is removed and leaning against the building. And under the window, they find Katie's missing shoes. The most reasonable explanation was that they probably came off during a struggle. And nearby, an area of loose gravel appears to hold the last chilling piece of evidence. You could actually see where a body had been struggling in the gravel. You could see an outline of their, their legs, their arms, their torso. If what we're really seeing is the impression of a body in, in the rocks, well, then that tells me that she was at least assaulted here. This is where she was raped. 
Police think since Katie left her house keys at the party, she may have been trying to get inside through her bedroom window when she was surprised from behind. Who would see her on the side of the house taking off her screen? Maybe even somebody who had watched her, followed her home? Who knows? Maybe even somebody that might have been with her that we didn't know about. Detectives think Katie was held down, raped, and strangled to death behind her house. Then her killer drove to the landfill to cover his tracks. What were Katie's last steps right before she was murdered? Police know it was about a mile from the party back to her house. You want to know who lives on those routes, if you have any known sex offenders, or if, or if you have somebody that might have just moved in or somebody that saw something. We send out teams of detectives and knock on every door of every residence that possibly could have been an earshot of an encounter. But nobody along that one-mile route saw anything out of the ordinary. A little wider, again? Detectives begin to collect DNA samples from 30-plus partygoers. They also dig into another intriguing mystery. The ring Katie and Joe bought together is nowhere to be found. She was wearing it that night at the party, but when police found her body in the desert, the ring was not on her finger, and she was known to always be wearing that ring. We pretty much presume that the person that killed her probably kept that as a trophy or as a reminder of what happened that night. Police try to track down the ring at local pawn shops, but come up cold. The pawn dealers know to be on the lookout for this ring, but it doesn't show up. The biggest mystery facing investigators was Katie raped and murdered by someone she knew, or was this a random killing? This is not something that's done by strangers. We just don't have that here. That just does not happen here. So right away, you're thinking, it's got to be somebody she knows. So at that point, the likelihood of someone at the party being our assailant is, you know, pretty high. Joe says Katie left the party angry around 3 a.m., but he didn't know why. But other partygoers tell a different story. They say the couple argued for a specific reason, a reason he failed to mention to police. Several of the people, including Katie, happened to walk into a room where her boyfriend, Joe, was kissing another female. Joe? And that's what upset Katie. What is this? Uh, then we realized that, hey, he didn't just get into an argument. He wasn't just flirting with another girl. He was actually caught kissing another girl at the party. And that's really what set Katie off. What I just saw, I can't believe that I just... She left everything at the party, her keys, her phone, everything, and took off walking. So she didn't even have a way to call her roommate and say, oh, I'm locked out, or meet me, or come get me. And according to Katie's mother, Jayanne, that's not what Joe himself had said. The question is, why would he lie to her? I asked Joe if he and Katie had argued, and he said no. And I thought that was odd. Detectives questioned Joe at the police station. Uh, I went after her. He admits to arguing with Katie and tells police he drove by the front of her house before dawn to check on her. But they find Joe's story hard to swallow. They didn't stop, they didn't get out, they didn't ring the doorbell, they didn't knock on the door. If you truly didn't know she was home, I don't know how much information at 3, 4, 5 o'clock in the morning you're going to glean by just driving by the residence. And why did Joe call Katie's cell phone all day? Hey, Katie. There's really no basis for him to be calling Katie's cell phone, leaving messages when he knows darn well he has the whole time. It almost made it look like he was trying to place himself somewhere else, that he doesn't know where she's at. See, I'm still trying to find her. I can't find her. Where is she? That's why I'm calling. The only reason that we could think of at that time was that he was just trying to create an alibi for himself. 
coming up. You would need to speak to my lawyer. As the heat mounts on Joe, police find his behavior more and more suspicious. It's just really strange that you wouldn't help with somebody that you profess to love. I remember feeling like I'd been kicked in the stomach. New Mexico State grad student Katie Sepich was found murdered after a late night party, and police are looking hard at her boyfriend, Joe. It's not just the fact that he was kissing another girl. What is this? It's not just the fact that he called her cell phone when he knew he had it. It's not just the fact that he drove by the resident, and didn't bother to stop, get down, check on her. But you put all those things together in one tight package, then you're starting to feel pretty good. Investigators think Joe was the last person to see Katie alive. And they had been arguing. We had a lot of circumstantial evidence, but we needed more. We needed a DNA match. Joe is 300 miles away with his family, but he has an appointment in Las Cruces with investigators to give a DNA sample. We contacted Joe and asked him if he was going to be available for his interview. You would need to speak to my lawyer. And he informed us that he wouldn't be speaking with us any further. I'm not, I'm not going to be there. I do apologize, but I'm not, I, I can't do it. Police were counting on Joe's DNA sample to either prove his innocence or nail down their case against him. But once you retain that attorney, that was pretty much out the window. People, I think, have the assumption that if you don't give DNA, you must be guilty. Why wouldn't you give the DNA if you're innocent? Katie's parents are shocked and confused by Joe's behavior. I remember feeling like I'd been kicked in the stomach. Joe had been a guest in our home. I believed he loved my daughter. I know my daughter loved him. Katie was laid to rest, surrounded by the people who loved and missed her. Joe is asked not to attend her funeral. I just felt like anyone that loved my daughter would be doing everything they could to help find the person that murdered her. It's just really strange that you wouldn't help with somebody that you profess to love. You will not even help with the investigation of their death. So that leads you to, to believe that, that he either has knowledge about it or he did it. But how can they find out what really happened? Detectives come up with a plan. If he's guilty and won't talk to them, maybe he'll talk to Katie. And one of the theories is that, that a person always has to relieve their mind somehow. We had a base created with flowers in it that had a uh, video and audio recorder. They place their surveillance gear near her grave in Carlsbad, hoping that Joe will stop by and say something to at least give them a lead. Maybe he's going to confess. Maybe he's going to say, I'm sorry. You know, something that can give police a reason to arrest him. Or maybe he'll say, who did do it? Maybe he knows more than he's saying. Okay. At the same time, they do everything possible to keep other avenues of the investigation open. As tempting as it was, we still couldn't throw all our eggs in one basket, so we're still having to follow other investigative leads. Yeah, did we ever get a, a make on those tires? Like the tire tracks at the crime scene. The impressions taken lead straight to the manufacturer of the tires. And they pretty much told us the size of the tire, that it was 65% worn, and probably what kind of vehicle they would be on. In most cases, the tire fits the wheel of a small pickup truck. They're also going to look at all the people that were at the party, all the suspects that they have, and see if any of them have a truck, and see if maybe that truck might match those tires. At Katie's memorial service, detectives canvassed the parking lot. We drove around looking at all vehicles that were present, uh, photographing those that had similar tire patterns, and writing down their license plate numbers. From the night of the murder, detectives pull every license plate run by local law enforcement, even in routine traffic stops. But none of the plates is from a small truck. In the meantime, 
Captain Jones dreams up a strategy to get around Katie's boyfriend Joe's refusal to volunteer his DNA. He actually came up with the brilliant idea of maybe they had a sexual encounter anytime while he was down for the weekend. They send the sheets from Katie's bed to their genetics lab, hoping to recover a sample of Joe's DNA. So we could uh, take a sample from Joe whether he wanted to or not. The lab finds male DNA on the sheets, but there's a twist. Sir, DNA it doesn't match the offender. He is not the killer. That means the killer might not be Joe after all. Back to school. That stunned not only the police, I think that stunned everybody in Las Cruces because I think so many people were convinced it was Joe. After detectives tell Joe about their test on the sheets, he agrees to give them a DNA sample. He says he didn't volunteer at first because he and Katie had sex just before the party. Katie and I had kind of messed, kind of fooled around. He thought we were going to find a sample of his DNA off Katie's body, and we were going to blame it on him. I think that's what he thought. Three months after Katie's murder, Joe is ruled out as a suspect. Now, police are dealing with their worst case scenario. The realization sets in that this really was probably a random act of violence, and we have absolutely no idea who did it. And they're still out there. We got to start over again. We've got to look over everything we did, everything we collected, and see, did we miss something? Is there somebody else? Investigators know DNA is still the key to finding Katie's killer. So they take a new approach. There was a new technique out where we sent a DNA sample off of our suspect, and they would break it down into ethnicity. The new test finds a mix of genetic markers in the killer's DNA. Native American, Puerto Rican, and South American. That means the suspect will probably look Hispanic. But weeks pass with no new leads. Detectives are getting desperate for a break in the case. We had a tremendous amount of time where you didn't have a lot coming in. And, you know, we'd tickle the media a little bit and try to generate interest and generate leads, but it got pretty slim. But sometimes, all it takes is one good lead. Four months after Katie's murder, they get a startling call from the Green Bay Sheriff's Department, 1,600 miles away in Wisconsin. He explained that they had a case that was almost identical to ours. 12 days before Katie was killed, a 26-year-old mother of two was abducted at night outside a Green Bay bar and then strangled, raped, and set on fire. She looked a lot like Katie. Her body structure was a lot like Katie's. There was a possibility that they were the same people that they were involved in ours. The only difference was that their victim didn't die. She actually got up and, and was able to run off and, and get some help. And most importantly for everyone in Las Cruces, she says she can identify her attackers. Maybe they just happened to be driving by, saw Katie. This was their chance, and they took it. Maybe this is them. Maybe this case is going to be solved. Maybe there's going to be an arrest finally. Up next, police think Katie Sepich may be the latest victim of a cross-country serial killer. Well, we just thought this is it. We're going to find out that this is these are the people that killed Katie, so we were very hopeful. Four months after Katie Sepich was brutally murdered in the dead of night, Las Cruces detectives may be finally closing in on her killers. 1,600 miles away in Wisconsin, a young woman was attacked at night with a very similar M.O. to Katie's murder. She went through quite a bit. At least one guy sexually assaulted her. They had beat her up and strangle her to unconsciousness. And then she wakes up and, and finds that she's on fire. Somehow, the woman survives and gives a detailed description of her attackers. Rob? A Green Bay dairy farmer identifies them as his former employees. 
27-year-old Gregorio Morales, and Juan Nieto, 23. Police discovered that both men have ties to New Mexico. Morales is living in Roswell, just 170 miles away, and Nieto has relatives in Las Cruces. It was exciting. It was, wow, is this going to be it? Is these two guys Katie never even knew? Are these the ones that got her? We're going to find out that these are the people that killed Katie, so we were very hopeful. Gregorio Morales is arrested for the assault in Green Bay, but his DNA doesn't match the samples recovered from Katie. Juan Nieto is nowhere to be found. And we didn't know his whereabouts, if his DNA would be a match to ours. In November, America's Most Wanted airs a segment on Katie's case featuring Nieto. It was exciting to report at that time because you thought the next call you get from the officers are going to be, we got him. Green Bay police receive hundreds of tips, leading to the arrest of Nieto in Atlanta, Georgia. He is extradited to Wisconsin to stand trial. But when his DNA is compared to that of Katie's killer, once again, there is no match. So Nieto wasn't involved in Katie's attack. It's like being on an emotional roller coaster. You get your hopes up, and then, you know, then it's not the guy. And we started thinking we just may never know. You know, we just may never know. By now, 20 months have passed since Katie Sepich's murder and Las Cruces investigators are frustrated to find themselves without a single viable suspect or lead. But they know the killer's still out there, and all he has to do is make one mistake. So the thing that we gotta hope is he's not dead, because if he's alive, sooner or later, he's gonna do something and it's gonna come up. And that's what you have to hope for. There wasn't a time when we just said, I mean, we're not gonna solve this and just put it up on a shelf. It was, it was worked. Katie's parents double the reward offered in the arrest of their daughter's killer to $100,000. Any chance that we got, we try to bring Katie's name up, just to remind people so people don't forget. We didn't want Katie to be forgotten. There's some cases that you just can't solve. We became quite concerned that this one was headed to the same place. You live this case from the time that you wake up till the time that you go to bed. You can't get it out of your mind. It just becomes a part of you. It's excruciating that your child is gone, that your child is so brutally taken. But the not knowing, the wanting those answers, that makes it even worse. Finally, after three years of suffering, the Sepich family's prayers may be answered. CODIS, the national database run by the FBI, reports a positive DNA match for Katie's killer. When you get that match, you know that you have the right person. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. This is the guy. We didn't even want to wait till morning. We were just so excited. I think a lot of people that had covered this story were like, who is it? Katie's killer says he didn't do it, right up until detectives confront him with something he thought he'd never see again. He sunk in his chair, and I told him, I said, I've got you. Why don't we start from the top? More than three years after Katie Sepich's brutal murder, detectives finally get the news they've been praying for a so. DNA match to her killer. For me, it was like an adrenaline rush. We were ready. All of us were ready to go. 26-year-old Gabriel Avila is already in jail, serving a nine-year sentence for aggravated burglary. But that crime wasn't a simple burglary. Just three months after Katie Sepich was killed, Avila was caught breaking into another New Mexico State student's apartment 
when she was home. Gabriel was charged with a burglary, but, but he knew who lived there. It looks like Katie's killer was hunting for another victim. There's no doubt that, that he targeted those young ladies and, and what his intentions were. On a late November night, Avila broke into the apartment through the back door, armed with a knife. You know, he didn't either know that she had a roommate or didn't anticipate the roommate being home. The girls heard someone in the back room and locked themselves in the bathroom where they called 911. There's a man in my apartment. Avila was apprehended minutes later. What was interesting about it in this case, he had taken a knife, which was pretty ominous. Detectives think he may have again had deadly intentions probably realized, hey, it's not that easy to strangle somebody. And so he's adding to his repertoire. I have no doubts that he would have killed one or both of those females. And, and if he hadn't been caught then, he would have went on to, to kill other females. After his burglary arrest, Avila skipped out on his bond and escaped to Mexico. More than a year passed before he tried to re-enter the U.S. and was taken back into custody. Now, detectives want to make sure they can build an airtight case against him for Katie's murder. You want to make sure that, that this guy's never back out on the street again. You know, this case that you've lived and breathed every day is over. They talked to Avila's ex-wife, who still lives in Las Cruces. She tells detectives about an item that unmistakably ties Avila to Katie, her missing diamond ring. We were obviously excited about that. I was like, well, did you sell it or do you still have that ring? She said that she had uh, found it while cleaning Gabriel's truck. She thought her husband was having an affair. Before I realized that but she planned to sell the ring if times got tough. Tell you that we're Katie's ring plays a critical role in Avila's post-arrest interview. You have the right to remain silent. You have the right to... Investigators want a confession, but they fully expect him to lie. You could tell when we started talking to him that he had a rehearsed story. Avila denies playing any role in Katie's death until he sees her diamond ring. Can you explain that? I couldn't have asked for it to work better. I mean, he sunk in his chair, and I told him, I said, I've got you. Seeing the ring shocks Avila out of his made-up story. You know what? You lied to me, and you've been lying to me since I got here. From that point forward, I said, look, let's just start over and tell me the truth. I was just trying to buy some low, man. And he confesses, and he tells them what happened. And we finally know what Katie's last moments were. We finally know how he saw her, what he did. And it was, OK, the pieces of the puzzle are now here. We know. Avila says that he drove into the high range neighborhood that night to buy cocaine. He saw Katie walking along the road alone. He pulled up to her, asked her if she needed a ride. Where are you going? She home. said, no, I'm fine. I just live down the street. He let her walk off and then kind of drove behind her very slowly, watched her get to the house, got out of his truck. Avila followed Katie to the window and attacked. She tried hard to fight him off, but was overpowered. He tells detectives that after the rape, he decided he had no choice but to kill her. And if I get up and just leave, she's going to go in, she's going to call the police, I'm going to go to jail. And so he made the decision at that time in his mind that he was going to kill her. No! 
Then he drove her body to the landfill. He tried to cremate her corpse to destroy the evidence. Almost three and a half years after Katie's murder, her killer is arraigned in court. Gabriel Avila was formally charged with Katie's rape and murder on December 26th, 2006, which would have been her 26th birthday. So that was an incredible birthday gift for Katie. Gabriel Avila pleads guilty to multiple charges, including first-degree murder, and is serving a life sentence in a New Mexico prison. Gabriel's removed from society. He's got to pay, pay for what he's done. Doesn't help the, the Savage family any. They, they've lost their daughter uh, forever. But Katie's parents are trying to make something positive from her tragic death by reforming the nation's DNA collection laws. Gabriel Avila's DNA was taken only after he was convicted of aggravated burglary, not when he was arrested more than three years earlier. If we had been able to take his DNA when he was arrested for that crime, less than three months after he killed our daughter, we, we would have been able to identify him then in three months instead of three years and three months. For the past seven years, Jay Ann and Dave Seppich have fought to introduce new legislation to allow for DNA collection at the time of a felony arrest. Offenders are going to be picked up more quickly, and they're going to be prevented from doing things. New legislation called Katie's Law passed the New Mexico legislature in 2006. Since then, 26 other states have adopted Katie's Law. It's hard to measure how many victims have been spared, how many lives have been saved. I think Katie would be very proud that her name is on laws that are bringing justice and healing and also preventing this pain from happening to families like it happened to hers. <laughs>